if you want to know how to just simply hire somebody who's going to help you transform your business into something that's relatively passive, hire a delegator. If you can hire a delegator, that person can build all your systems for you. You can just go to the owner position, hire the person that's going to be able to systemize the things that you need to do and optimize for you. Welcome to the podcast, Real Estate Investing with Coach Carson. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show to help you build a profitable and passive rental property business so you can get out of the grind and do more of what matters. Really excited to have you here today. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you're an old listener, thank you for being back for another episode. We are going to talk about a topic that I I love. I'm kind of nerdy about this topic in my book, The Small Mighty Real Estate Investor. I wrote a whole chapter about systemizing and automating your rental property business with the ultimate goal. Of course, real estate does take some work on the front end. You got to invest your time finding properties, getting financing. But the cool thing about owning rental properties, they start off with a lot of work on the front end, but they can end up passive enough to the point where for me personally, I spend a couple hours per week uh, on my rental properties, managing the manager, managing my tenants, doing little things here and there. But then I've been able to travel, been able to do things with my family. So we're going to get into the nuts and bolts today. And I have a friend of mine, one of the best people I know on this to talk about this topic with me, someone named Justin Foster. Justin, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Dad. It's really good to be back. And uh, thanks for having me. It's going to be fun. Absolutely. So Justin was on a prior episode where we talked about his transition from working a full-time job to transition to being full-time and rental properties and flipping properties and rentals. So I'll have a link to that in the show notes and the video description if you want to check that out. That's a great episode as well. But Justin, I, I, we're going to get into the nuts and bolts as it is, I just talked about of systems and processes and building a team. And you have a really unique way. We both have kind of different uh, nuances in how we do it, which is going to be great to talk about. But just to let everybody know a little bit more about you. I want to hear, let them know more about your background. So let's kind of give them the highlights of, how, uh, of your real estate story of what, what, what drew you to it and kind of what your journey has been like so far with your own real, uh, real estate investing. Right. Yeah. So I got into investing in real estate by kind of leaving a house in Denver and renting that out on accident. We just didn't have any other options. And so we decided that we moved from from Denver to Oklahoma, and I live in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, um, invest in the Tulsa market. So we kept that rental for a couple of years. It was difficult for us to manage uh, long distance. And so we sold that, took the equity out of that. Um, it was a half a duplex, like 700 square feet. And so that was the start. Um, but took the equity out of that and invested here in Tulsa, which is just a different, a different market altogether. It's more cash flow less appreciation than a place like Denver. Um, and I just caught the bug of, I want to retire early with real estate. I became obsessed with that. I started really just leaning in and, and learning and investing in myself as much as I possibly could. And um, started buying, uh, you know, single family or small multifamily units. Um, and so we've grown that portfolio um, over the last, five years now and are now at a place where we're living off of rental income. It's our sole source of income or our main source of income, I should say, not our sole source, but it's the main thing. It, it pays for all of our lifestyle. And, you know, I have guys like you to thank for kind of leading the way and showing me how to do that. Um, so in 2020, which is, this is kind of thrown back to the episode that we had before, I quit my job right before COVID and really made a run at being a full-time real estate investor and being an entrepreneur. And so that put the heat on me to figure out, you know, systems and hiring people and, you know, going um, at a little bit faster pace. So I went through a season of hustle and just over the last year or so, I've been starting to shift gears and sort of slow down and try to get to an optimized state of, you know, what that business looks like. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the trajectory of the last five, six years with real estate investing. And I love it. I love this little business. I uh, love the freedom that it gives us, but I also just love being able to provide housing for people. And, you know, I think it's just really meaningful for me and my family to be able to be in this business. 
Well, I just want to say congratulations publicly. I got to see that journey kind of firsthand when you took the leap. And who would have known that would be also the COVID year? And what a, what a crazy yeah, year, yeah. year to, to jump out. But, you know, it's making that leap to be an entrepreneur. It's really, it is a big leap, you know, and you, but you were ready and you, it wasn't all easy, but uh, I want to. I want to. We're going to get into the specifically about rental properties and systematizing that. But I know you and I both have a, a background in doing other parts of the real estate business, in particular flipping houses, fixing them up, and flipping them, and buying properties and wholesaling. I wonder if you could just touch on that a little bit, and maybe after talking about your experience with it, just juxtaposing that part of the business, the flipping business, and how active that is versus the rental property business and managing those. Because those are two things that people get mixed up a little bit, but they're really two different business models. Absolutely. Yeah. And wholesaling is really not about real estate. People don't understand that. It's just about buying low, selling high. You could do that with hinges, like door hinges. And so the same principle is apply. And I learned that pretty early on that, you know, I'm not thinking like an investor necessarily as I'm building this wholesaling business. So we built a a wholesale business um, here in Tulsa in Oklahoma City. And for a couple of years there, we were probably doing more volume than anybody else in Oklahoma in terms of sourcing off market properties. But <clears throat> mechanically what you're doing with, with wholesaling is um, you're, buying distressed properties or buying properties from motivated sellers at a at a discount and then selling it or sourcing it for other investors. And so it's not too dissimilar from flipping. Uh, flipping is, you know, more involved on swinging a hammer um, and, and actually improving the property. Uh, but really wholesaling is just about finding the value, finding the deal, sourcing that deal uh, for other people. And being a deal finder, is very simple. Um, there's very simple principles to follow kind of wholesaling is simple. Wholesalers are complicated, um, <laughs> is kind of a way to think about that. Um, business is simple. Business owners are complicated. Um, and, and so we try to really simplify like how we understood that business and not overcomplicate it too much. And so we were able to grow from that, from that foundation. And so comparing that to rental properties, and maybe this would be a good, I want to kind of get to some first principles of business operations, really, because I think this is, when, when I go back to what I started this episode with, I talked about, uh, there's this book called The E-Myth, which I highly recommend people read. I don't, did you ever read that book, Justin? I know you've, you've oh, read yeah. all sorts of systems. I've told that, people, yeah. I, I have a business degree, like for my undergrad, and I would almost swap out just the education from that book for my entire undergrad degree. So it's so good. I mean, it's yeah. just on point. Yeah, and this is, it has a lot of stories, but what it, it, the thing I, I I just always remember that the principles because of those stories is there that you you look at your business like, almost like you're tinkering with a with an engine or with a mechanical clock or something like your business mm -hmm. is the system is itself. And the the big aha moment for me, and I was lucky to read it early in my career, was you you can't just work in your business. That was the that's the e myth. The e myth is that you're going to start a business and it's all automatically going to be you're going to be an owner of a business. What's what's really happening? Most people get in there and they just replace their job working for somebody else with a job working for themselves. Like that's the that's mm -hmm. the different that's the myth. And so yeah, the, so the, the the principle and I want to let you run with this, Justin, is that you got to work on your business. You have to like look at your business as a set of systems. So maybe let's, let, let's, let's use the idea of wholesaling, flipping versus rental properties, just to talk about like, what are the basics of a wholesaling business? You said it was kind of simple. What are the basic you know, operations of a system that you work with in wholesaling? And then let's, let's use that to transition to rental properties and let's talk about the, the basic operations of what actually happens inside that, that machine of either one of those businesses. Yeah, well, I can start with just, you know, just the general framework of a business from that book is the idea that you have a technician, you have a manager, and then you have an owner, right? And so the technician is the doer, just very simply. They do things, they do tasks. You know, the manager uh, manages the technicians and manages the processes and can even build systems for you. And the owner has a specific mindset um, that is at 50,000 feet, right? Um, and so wearing all three of those hats, for instance, like in a wholesaling business, um, you're what you would call a solopreneur and there's nothing wrong with being a solopreneur. Um, but you, you, you don't really own a business when you're a solopreneur, you own a job, you know, that's kind of what you're saying. And so, 
So there's a way to build that and to think like an owner to where you can navigate that to the owner position and then have people on your team that you're able to delegate to that are going to be able to take care of the day-to-day operations and the doing of the business. Um, you know, for, for wholesaling, some of those, those items are marketing very simply. So you're marketing for off-market properties. Um, and so there's an entire operation that happen, happens around putting out marketing. Marketing is very simple. Um, there's simple rules to kind of follow to have successful marketing and um, that, that I could get into later. Uh, but you have the sales process and really, you know, you have two aspects of sales. You have sourcing the deal and then selling the deal. So acquisitions and dispositions. Um, that's it when it comes to a wholesaling business. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I'll just I'll just comment on that real quickly because I want to use that framework again with rental properties too. Is that you basically it's almost like departments. I think about it like departments in a business. I don't know if that's fair to mm-hmm. say. Like you have the marketing department, you got the sales or the acquisitions department, and then in the wholesaling you got the dispositions or the, the getting rid of the property department. So you have those three departments. Even if you're doing it yourself, so we're all solo entrepreneurs. We're small and mighty investors. At least at first, you're going to be doing all three of those roles. And the big aha for me when I was early in my business, my business partner and I sat down in the room before we even had a business. It was kind of crazy. And we said, all right, here's this org chart of like who we are. We got to have like an acquisitions person, a financing yeah. person, a, a, you know, a rehab manager and a like property manager dispositions person. And so it was like, it was kind of crazy just to put all, put our, we had to put all those hats on and say, all right, Tommy, you do this. I'll do this. We had like 15 yeah. roles that we, we distributed. So I, I guess I'm just I'm making a commentary there that it's useful like everybody's listening to this where if you're going to wholesale you like listening to Justin and describe those departments is a really useful framework because that helps you know what you have to, the roles you have to play there. So I'll just let you run with it from there, but just wanted to comment on that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have these, uh, you kind of begin with that, that structure and, or, or that the seats and you have to kind of form yourself early on into the seat, right? So in addition to that, you also have accounting, for instance, and maybe you're also the accountant at the same time that you're the sales uh, acquisitions guy at the same time that you're um, doing all the marketing. And, you know, what, what becomes very apparent as you sort of morph yourself into all, all these different seats or wearing all the hats is that you're really good at certain things and you really like certain things, um, but you're not very good at other things and you don't like other things. And so I think there's really um, a couple of things that are helpful early on to think about the business as a structure of like, okay, what is an optimal business of what I'm working on? So for rental properties, you know, I have a property manager, I have an accountant, you know, I have an acquisitions department whenever I'm growing. And you can kind of org chart that out with who is on your team and your team may be early on just you or you and your partner. Um, but as you grow into those positions, you realize, Hey, I like this. I'm good at this. I'm not so good at this. I I would rather jump off a cliff than do this. So I'm going to delegate those things. Right. And, um, when you externalize that and you have your org chart in front of you, then you can see, okay, I have, I have a seat. You know, and we can get into what it means to, to, to occupy that seat and, and to build a business where you have a rock star in every single seat. And that rock star doesn't have to be you. And I think that's the shift from the, the solopreneur, I, I own a job to I own a business, right? Yeah. It's figuring out rock, other people who are better than you and other seats that, you know, are they're talented at. Love it. Yeah, I think that's a good framework. So really what we're trying to do here today is describe the seats, describe the seats you need in your business, whether it's wholesaling or rental properties, which we'll focus on. And then how do we help you fill those seats with people who can help you run it so that you're not doing everything? Because ultimately, that's the goal of most people is to at least be able to have some flexibility to step away from the business. And I personally love, I love stepping back into the business here and there. That's, we can talk about that too, like being the craftsperson, the person who every once in a while goes back and does the deals and does the acquisitions. That's fun. Um, but at the same time, it's nice to be able to, to step away and go to Spain for a year. Or you and I were talking yeah. offline about your family taking time off the summer and being with family and when, when things, because when, life happens. And so having a business 
that can run without you and has systems is the goal. And you have the flexibility then to step in, step out, you know, to take a break. And so that's, that's really what we're trying to do here. And I, I, and I mentioned you're, you're the one who has done this really well. I've seen behind the scenes of a lot of businesses, you do an excellent job of this. So, so let, let's, let's take this a step further and let's talk about rental properties because wholesaling is a whole nother topic and it's very relevant to acquisitions part particularly, but most, most people who are listening to this are going to be the small, small rental property investors. Maybe they already own a few properties and they're trying to scale a little bit to get to 10 properties or 20 properties. So let's, let's talk about the rental operation. Maybe, and maybe could, could you describe the departments or the seats of a typical rental property, small, mighty rental property business? What does that org chart look like for, for them? Mm. Yeah. So with a rental property business, you have a property manager that's doing a, a whole lot and that can do a whole lot. Right. And, and there's le- what that property manager is, you know, could potentially be in charge of is leasing, um, maintenance calls or tenant communication, um, uh, some accounting or, you know, booking, bookkeeping potentially. So uh, an accounting department. And then outside of that, uh, you have asset management uh, at a higher level, uh, and and you have you know kind of in, in, within asset management again the same dynamic of acquisitions and dispositions, right? And and sort of how how you're thinking as an asset manager or portfolio manager um, in that, and uh, so that's how our rental property business is structured. It's very small. And, you know, we, we kind of focus on those, those three departments. Yeah. And I'll add one more under the asset management is financing too, because, because yeah. once you, and I mean, it could almost be its own thing, right? Like the financing, mm-hmm. any, you can organize this however you want to everybody when you're listening to this, but yeah, I love the, I love the frame that you gave of an asset manager because it's kind of like that, that, that meta idea of stepping outside your business. The property manager is inside the business. It's the person taking the calls. It's the person leasing the properties. It's the person um, managing the maintenance people. Like that's a real role that, you could do yourself, even if you're, even if you hire a third party, you're still going to be, you know, involved in like, you're almost like the, you know, the, the board of directors for the property manager, like you're going to be giving them feedback and, and input, but that those roles, everybody kind of gets those. The asset manager though, is like that higher level that when you're, when you're starting your business, the whole, the goal of the asset manager is grow, grow, grow. We got to load this thing up. We got to buy properties. We got to finance them later on, which I did. I talked about in the book a little bit. I tried to emphasize is that you then have to change games and you have to start maybe reallocating your capital, like pay off some debt perhaps or refinance. And so, so we'll get into some of those details, but this, I'm just going to repeat what you said. So everybody's like taking notes here. You have a property manager who does leasing maintenance, kind of customer service tasks Mm -hmm. and then accounting. So just like the reports and making sure the bills are paid, receivables, um, filing taxes, all those could be under that department. And then you got this acquisition manager role who does buying properties, financing properties Mm -hmm. and disposing of properties. So Mm -hmm. got it. All right. So, so how how do you think? Yeah, I'll I'll say, I'll say, I'll say um, one thing about sort of this uh, rental property business. Right. So rental property, you kind of think investment business is a business and you're sort of in, if you think about Robert Kiyosaki's cash, cash flow quadrant, a rental property business is both, I think of it as in the I category and in the B category, especially if you're small like us and you're sort of doing, you're managing the manager, you are the portfolio manager and, and the, the idea that it's passive enough. And, um, there's a lot of effort that gets put into leveraging capital. You know, how do we maximize our leverage or what's too much leverage? And, 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 and a rental property, growing rental properties, capital is a huge dynamic. Well, the, the other form of leverage is people, right? And so it often gets overlooked. And, and so it's, it's important to know how to pull that lever. And if you can pull that lever, maybe you put yourself in a position where you don't have to, lever up as much over here on the capital stack. Right. Um, and, and so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there that if you, if you work on a rental property business, that's passive enough, then really the key is the people that you're delegating to. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, in in a lot of ways, because it it gives you more and better options. 
I love that. That frame of leverage is what we're all trying to get into real estate for, but leverage of, of awesome people, of all stars. Of, of, and so mm. can you talk about that? I want to go step up a little bit and kind of take this segue, but le this principle of leverage and why that's so important. Can you just like, can you kind of double click on that and go a little deeper on how that makes you, why that's such an important principle if you're trying to go from a small amount of money to a large amount of money and to have this freedom that we're talking about? Like why, why is leverage even... Uh, uh, and such an important concept. Well, one of the things that leveraging people is uh, in, in terms of being able to leverage people, your, your ROI is just astronomical compared to what you can get sometimes in leveraging capital. Meaning, you know, if you hire somebody, I think of it like I want to be able to get a five times return on what I'm paying for this person. And also the commitment in hiring somebody, a lot of people think, well, if I'm going to hire somebody and I'm going to pay them a salary of, you know, $60,000 a year, um, well, that's, that's a lot of money. How could I ever do that? Well, that's not really what your risk reward um, is in that situation. It's oversimplified. Where you, if you're hiring and you're paying attention, you're paying like $5,000 a month. And if you're, if you're, if you're, you know, hiring slow and firing fast, then your your risk is five thousand dollars a month, but this person could make five times, ten times, you know, a hundred times more for you, either in revenue or return on equity or however your business is set up. And so, so I think that leveraging people um, is in many ways like the ticket, and it's everything that the E myth is based on. You have to have people who are the technician. You have to have people that are um, the manager in order for you to sit in the owner seat and be at 50,000 feet. So if you want to get out of the weeds, and a lot of that is boils down for like me and you, it's about just buying back your time and doing more of what matters to you. And so it's not just about making money necessarily, like the, the numbers are there to justify, you know, learning how to hire people and attract good talent. But in terms of your lifestyle, um, that's also the ticket because you know, once you're able to not just get to the end phase, but develop a process in which as you're hustling in a season, for instance, you're doing what you you love, like you're enjoying your season of hustle. I think that's a good goal. I think, mm -hmm. I think you want to be able to, um, you know, do what matters now. Right. And what matters now is, you know, what you're good at, what gives you life. <laughs> and the things that don't matter to you, you want other people to do for you and, and for that to matter to them. And it's meaningful for, for, to see the things that you don't love that other people love flourish. You know what I mean? Like that's, mm -hmm. that's just a really rewarding aspect of um, leveraging other people. So it's not, it's not like you're using people or anything. You're, you're acknowledging your limitations and, um, you know, everybody kind of levels up whenever that happens. Yeah, I told you earlier that one of my favorite metaphors is the is the sports team and how like mm -hmm. I get I get excited when when you have a good team member. It's almost like you're the head coach who recruits this all star player, and you know the, the coach is important, but they're like when you in the big scheme of things with a team like the the player like they they are the star like they're the person who's like who's executing and shooting the if, use my basketball metaphor which I love they're the ones shooting the basket. The biggest reward as a coach is to see these people you recruited thrive and do well and live their life well. And so it's, it's mm -hmm. like a, it's a symbiosis. Yeah. Like I, I always, I always kind of chuckle when I hear like the, that us versus them stuff that you know, if you, if you just read Twitter for 10 minutes, you're going to get this both with the landlord and the tenant, but also with the employee and the employer. Like it's, it's just like, it has to be antagonistic or something in naturally in those relationships. And we could get into why that is and the philosophy behind that. But my experience has been on the best teams I've been on. It's like, no, this is like that. Not one plus. It's not like you're subtracting from one another. Like it's me versus the employee. It's like when you get a good team together, it's like one plus one plus one equals like a thousand. Like you're you're you're, yeah. unlock, you're unlocking potential. You're paying someone money that they can use to live their life, but you're also paying them and rewarding them and their potential. Like their potential's here, and you're helping them get to their potential up here. You know, at, at a higher level. So it's I, I I'm just kind of validating what you're saying. Like this is a very rewarding well, thing. Not only and, not only with money, but in a lot of other ways. And in a lot of ways, it's also they're helping you get to your potential, right? So when you hire somebody, um, you know, if you, especially if you're like, 
if you really try to hire a rock star, which you should, you should not settle for, well, I'm okay with this person. They're a seven out of 10 and they can do the job. And so I'll just hire that person. Like that's a huge mistake. It's not going to work out for you. Hire somebody like hire over your head, you know, hire somebody where it's like, I've got to be on my game and get this person what they need because I'm trying to catch up to them um, and, 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 and lead them. And they're, they're a leader themselves. And so I, I think, I think it's, if I think it's a major thing that people don't, don't hear very often, but if you want to know the number one, probably differentiator on like how hiring, how to, how to just simply hire somebody who's going to transform, help you transform your business into something that's relatively passive, hire a delegator. If you can hire a delegator, then there's, there's delegators and there's doers. You know, if you can hire a delegator, that person can build all your systems for you. And, and you're, you're hiring from an owner position, right? And so you don't have to just sit in the manager position and hire the technician. You can just go to the owner position, hire the person that's going to be able to like systemize the things that you're doing and that you need to do and, 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 and optimize for you. And there's folks who are, who are wired for that. All right. So I got a bunch of questions on that. So we're, we're going to dig into that topic because I want to learn more about it. I think it's so cool to hire people who can help you delegate, not just hire people to do it. So I, I want to circle that. We're going to come back to it. I want to, I want to hit on one point before we get there, just about the math of hiring someone. And when I say hiring and when you're saying hiring, just whenever I, everybody listening to this, you might be thinking, well, I don't, I don't have employees. I've never done this. Well, this could be hiring your property manager. This could be hiring a contractor. Like, so it's, 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 yeah. you, it's you spending. So I want to, I want you to explain something for us. When you spend money, instead of doing everything yourself, like the, the original idea might be, I can fix this myself. I can lease the property myself. Why would I want to pay 10% to a property manager? Why would I want to pay $200 of this plumber to fix that thing when I could do it? So talk to me, Justin, about, you, you mentioned earlier that if you hire a rock star, if you hire a good person, if they cost you 5,000 a month or 1,000 per month or $200 for a plumbing bill, the right person will make you five to 10 times more than that. Like, how is that so? Like, how, how can, as an entrepreneur, let's put it, put our hat on of the person who's growing their business right now. Like they have other properties they're trying to buy. They're working a full-time job. Like, how is it that me paying someone, you know, every month to do something that, that I could do actually makes me more than the money that I paid them? Yeah. It, I mean, that's, <laughs> it's a matter of freeing up time and capacity to focus on, the thing that moves the needle the most, right? In your business. So if you're in an acquisition mode, the thing that's going to move the needle the most in your business is um, making offers. So if you're, if you're wanting to grow and let's say get five more units to get to this plateau, well, you need to make X amount of offers. But if you're spending your time fixing leaky toilets and doing all the bookkeeping yourself and all these other things, you don't have the time to go make, you know, the, the hundred offers that it takes to get five really, really good deals. And, and so there's some things are, are directly uh, associated with generating revenue. Like if you have a salesperson, you can see I'm paying this person X amount of dollars and they're generating X amount of dollars in revenue. But if they're an administrator, that's not necessarily the case, but it's like, how much does that administrative person or that manager uh, take off the plate or optimize the overall system so that, you know, more offers can be made. And um, so, so you can measure those things and, and, and that's part of, uh, understanding your business is sort of managing what you measure or, or you know, ma measuring the things that, that matter. And, um, and so you, you should be able to say, okay, well, if, if, if I hired this person, I'm going to be able to spend and allocate X amount of, you know, hours into this department that's going to, to grow our business, you know, fivefold. Yep. So it's, it's me measuring money or measuring time, like those are two, yeah. both, and time is, mm -hmm. you mentioned like, that's often the most limited commodity we have, especially when we're busy and we got things going on. So if you freed up five or 10 hours per week that you could then go out and make offers, the translation of that would be, if I did that for the next month or two, I could potentially buy a property that would make me 
you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars over the next 10 years, but maybe like you, you might make 30,000 bucks in equity like today by, by doing mm -hmm. that. You, and so you can, it's a real, it's a real return, but there is a fear there, isn't there? Like, like, am I really going to make that money? Like I, I, I I'm, I'm definitely paying that person a thousand bucks, but am I really going to make, so it's, it's, I, I, I hear when I talk to people like that disconnect between those steps of like, I know I'm going to spend the cash, but I'm not confident that I could actually go out and generate the money with those extra five to 10 hours. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that, that leap, that entrepreneurial leap of, of no, have the, having the faith that you can actually go out and, and make that happen. Okay. Well, and, and I understand the fear. The fear is something to look into and why you have that fear. And, and you just could sort of, everybody can kind of just see what is um, limiting, you know, their belief there. Uh, but what, what I find is logic and just some practical, uh, practical look at that to be able to say, okay, what's the worst that happens, right? And, and so if you're saying, well, this person costs $60,000 a year, again, it's not the case. This person's going to cost $2,500 part-time for six weeks, right? So would you invest $2,500 to see if they can help you transform your business and, you know, accomplish the goals that you're set after? And, and so I, I, I think that, um, the basis of that fear oftentimes has to do with the way in which people limit themselves and have limiting beliefs about themselves and what they're capable of. Uh, ultimately, I, being a business owner is about leadership and, um, you know, and, and that is, has to do with sort of figuring out how to get out of your own way and lean into, um, you know, an opportunity to where you have somebody to lead and, 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 and to sort of test yourself on that. And, and you might surprise yourself. And that's why I say it's, it's a two way street. It's not just like you giving to them top down. I mean, they're giving to you to unlock the potential of what that leadership um, could look like. And, um, but you, you don't really get to do that unless you commit to hiring somebody. Yeah, it's a personal growth. It, it, it absolutely is. When you start paying someone else and you also start leading someone else, you as the teacher, you as the leader have to grow, grow like 10 times more than you did before. It's a real, well, it's a real thing. The good news is though, is like, you don't have to be somebody that you're not. It's actually the opposite. Being a leader is all about being more of who you are. And so the more honest you are, it's like, like when you hire somebody, hire somebody and say, I suck at this. And I think that you're going to be good at it <laughs> and I need your help. And, and that's, I mean, that's how you navigate that. You know, you don't have to have all your ducks in a row. That's not the point. They're the people who are going to get your ducks in a row for you. Yeah. And and so kind of just being honest and um, open about sort of where the weak spots are and how they're going to fill the gap. I mean, folks uh, want to be needed. So that strategy of, of, of sort of just being honest about your own limitations and transparent about that works yeah. very well, you know. <laughs> Yeah. It's 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 a, a critical piece, I think. Yeah, well said. So I I want to get into some specific examples that you've li you're, you've lived within your rental property business. I like I think I think all of this is really important. Like the philosophy of being a business owner, how to make investments, investing in people, not just investing in properties. You're investing your money and paying people to do stuff for you. So like everybody, keep that in mind. But I, I want to ask Justin some spe you some specific examples. You mentioned earlier about hiring a delegator. Could you talk more about your actual rental property business? Because everybody has different approaches, and I'll, I'll talk some about mine as well. But I'd love to hear for everybody else that kind of unpack your, what does your rental operation look like and who have you hired um, to help you run that? Yeah, so we we have our own rental property business that manages mostly just our, our properties. We have a few properties that uh, we manage for really close friends and family. So it's a total of 55 doors that that, pro that property management company uh, manages. And what we found is having one key team member who's a property manager who's um, not here in the United States, they're in the Philippines. Um, and they're, they're the property manager role for that business. And so when it comes to the day to day operations, tenant communication, leasing, document control, um, we have, you know, kind of mail collecting mail virtually and everything like that. I mean, they're, they're just on top of, you know, getting utilities in place and uh, managing those processes from an asset management standpoint. Uh, I have one key team member, uh, 
who is really a COO for me that oversees a couple of different businesses for us. And so she's able to oversee the property management business, but we also have a lending business and she was in charge of the wholesaling business. Whenever we were optimizing that, we since have pivoted towards more leveraging more capital than people. But, but so she's, she's over kind of, you know, that altitude and all the operations and systems and everything else. So really two people, very small, that's immediately like on our team. Um, and then there's me and my wife in the property management business. And I have another partner, Joel, and uh, the lending business. But we act as owners, you know, in those roles. Um, so I have, very cool. I've got, I've got a lot of questions, if you don't mind. So yeah. I got just highlight, zooming in on the property management business. You mentioned that you have somebody who's remotely doing that. I think that would be pretty surprising to people. It's interesting. So this, would you call that person... Is, is that in the category of virtual assistant? I know that's sort of an d- old word that people don't always use, yeah. but is that, is, so they're virtually in a position, but you're using them here in the United States for a lot of, a lot of different roles. Is that right? That's right. Um, and we have, you know, specifically the role is property manager, right? Mm-hmm. So they are a manager of the entire thing. And so they're virtual, but I wouldn't necessarily call them an assistant. Um, in, in, in the sense of like they're in charge of, you know, kind of the, the, the main things of property management, which is occupancy, you know, lease renewals, so on and so forth. And, and they have uh, a lot of autonomy in how they control that. Um, and so the, that, the, I mean, not, not, not to say that we, we, we haven't had, you know, just virtual assistance and everything else, but we've made and had a little bit more success in, trying to find people who are overseas, but making them a key member of the team, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. And there's absolutely enough technology where those people don't have to, you know, be here locally. In fact, I let a local property manager go who is in house, um, who is doing an okay job, not a great job, but we were paying quite a bit um, for, for that person. And I think we're doing, you know, four times better than what we were doing, hiring a key team member from the Philippines and um, being in that role and then systemizing or automating or, you know, setting it up to where it could be from a virtual standpoint. There's a few things like, you know, sticking points on, you just have to be here. But again, those, those roles are filled by other team members like handymen and other folks that go around and put up signs and stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, if you don't mind, I'd love to get specific with some of the roles. So let's just like leasing, for example. So a tenant, a tenant gives you notice, 30 days notice, I'm going to move on. I'm, I'm buying a house or something. So that's a typical, mm-hmm. that's a typical property manager type situation. Could you, could you walk me through who kind of touches that process? Like what, what is the process there for you guys? And like, where, where would the property manager role who's, who's the, who's virtually managing it, where would he or she kind of step in? And then where, where do they, they bring in somebody else? Could you just kind of chronologically take me through that kind of those steps? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the property manager is just following a, a, a set process of what leasing looks like. So we would first off um, let, acknowledge that person and then try to get them to show the property for us um, while they're in the property still. And the way that we do that is we say, well, if you do, um, if you do set some showings and we're able to fill this unit while you're still there, then we'll discount half the last month of the rent. So, um, that allows for the tenant to kind of be the leasing agent and for us to have, you know, no vacancy and kind of fill it quickly. So, um, if that, if that doesn't happen, then that property is just managed through a system. We use a sauna. And once the property goes vacant, we have a handyman go do a walk through. They put a, um, lockbox on the property. There's an acknowledgement of, we use, you know, videos. The handyman uses a video to be able to you know, highlight wherever there's any damages. We document those damages. Um, property manager returns the security deposit based on the damages. And then we generate a scope of work. That scope of work gets approved by, in this case, Olivia, um, you know, and, and, and to do a make ready. And then, the leasing process is just a matter of having pictures that if we don't have pictures on the property, then the property manager you know, from the Philippines will be calling 
you know, our go-to photographer, go out there and take the pictures so that I can lease it. And then that person's like on Facebook, on Zillow, on Hot Pads and all these different places um, going through pre-screening processes with new prospective tenants. So we have a clear uh, pre-screening process for um, tenants. And then we have a, a pretty clear process of approving tenants and the move-in process. And so all of this is sort of lives in, you know, software and project management um, that was the project management of Asana and uh, software that we call Buildium um, and collecting money, paying money, all of that can be done, you know, pretty much virtually. And then we just, we don't give on things like, well, this contractor needs us to meet them with a check, you know, like that stuff happens all the time. It's like, well, we just don't do that, you know, so we'll go find a new contractor. Like if you can't be paid from bill.com, then we're not going to use you, you know? So, um, a lot of it is, you know, once you kind of define these systems and these processes that, that, that folks are running for you is instituting rules that are kind of critical for that system to work fluently. Love it. There's a lot of good stuff in there. You, you described very well what systems are. We didn't, dis- we didn't define that earlier, but you, you ha- it sounds like you have a lot of checklists. Like you have a checklist when somebody moves out, here's the things that have to happen, a lot box. Somebody's got to walk through the property, take videos. You've got a set of instructions, I would assume, procedures, like when, when we have a vacant property, when we have to return somebody's security deposit, here's how you take pictures, here's what you do, here's, here's where you upload that. So, so all of that, when we say systems, is that, am I describing that right? Or is it checklist, instructions, video instructions, and that lives in Asana, some, like online, which I'll put a link to, by the way. I, I, Asana is a, a project management software. There's others out there. Um, but is that, is that accurate, that you have like a set of um, checklists and, system and instructions and videos that kind of tell your people how to run the system? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's just a, it's a trusted system where you can clarify and organize every step along the way. You know, that's, that's basically what you need. That could be a checklist on your desk. You know, it could be sticky notes. It could be an Asana, but I mean, there's, it has to be trusted. Like if your if your system is sticky notes on your desk, can you download that to somebody else? And the answer is probably no, you can't. So can you, how do you build a trusted system in which other people can, can operate? And that's where it becomes kind of this living and evolving thing where you're constantly sort of working the system and optimizing it and, and refining it. Um, and I'm just to be clear, I'm not a systems person. I'm not an operation person. In fact, it's a huge weakness of mine. Um, and there's certain people have that, um, sort of built into them where, they get the how and they get, you know, how to just like make everything work in, in a certain way. Um, I, I, I've hired, I've hired somebody who is good at that. You know, I've hired multiple people who are good at that and you don't have to build the system. You know, in fact, one of the best things you could do is find somebody who's built the system and just copy it. Like, so you, you don't have to just like figure all this out from scratch. Just like, um, if you want to see what our system looks like, I mean, you could copy it. And, 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 and that to me is a way to sort of just get from here to here, um, without a lot of the headache and the brain damage that comes along with it. Yeah. A bit, I think a lot of people, they look at education and listening to podcasts in a more passive way. One of the things mm-hmm. I do, like with real estate investing specifically, and like the book I wrote, for example, like my, I, ha- I had in mind that I wanted somebody to pick this book up. And when they got to the chapter on property management and systems, like I wanted them to say, download this, install yeah. it in my, in my business. Like that, that was the idea. Like I don't, I don't like when you, a $25 book, you can actually, buy, you're basically buying a business model in a book, right? That's if you can find mm-hmm. the right, the right book or the right podcast or the right person. That's as when you're looking for education, don't just look for like random bits of information, like look for systems and be like, Oh, this is how they solve that problem. This is how they screen their tenants. This is how they turn over tenants. This is how they work with contractors. Like that is a, it's a different mindset really. When you, when you look at this whole thing we're talking about today, if you look at your business as, as a set of systems and a set of all stars who run your systems, then the education component is more about learning how to hire the right people, which I want to, I'm going to circle back around to that because I know that's something that we, we've mentioned a couple of times. And it's also saying, all right, here are some systems that I can copy and don't, I don't have to reinvent that wheel and start from scratch. Like 
people have done this. P- plenty of people have managed properties. Plenty of people have leased properties. Plenty of people have returned security deposits. We don't have to. We don't have to learn that from scratch. Yeah, and and, and there's a there there is a system of systems, right? So what I can encourage owners, uh, pro- business owners for, is is to try to find a structure that's going to give you the system of systems. And what I mean by that is um, there's a way in which people have just like laid out for you. This is how you work on your business, not in your business. And I'll give you a couple of resources real quick. Um, Traction is something that we use. Um, and it's something called the entrepreneur operating system. And uh, that gives an overall framework for basically, you know, here's how you create an org chart. Here's how you think about hiring. Here's how you think about, you know, um, SOPs. Uh, and here's how you think about, you know, scorecard and, you know, the things that are going to move the needle in that direction. And there's just a number of things that that system does to give you a framework so that you can kind of have this structure. I think of it like a, just a skeleton, and then you can put the meat on the bone. And, and so it's helpful to start with the structure and just, just learn from other people. And there's all kinds of resources out there on, um, just how to, how to do that. And, and, and you kind of just follow, follow their instruction. Um, I think a lot of people, they want to be too original and, um, it's not, it's just not very helpful, especially as you're, as you're starting out, you just want to kind of copy what everybody else is doing. And tr- so Traction's a book. I'll put a link to that as well, right? So there's a set of books or a book that kind of teaches this, how to, how to mm-hmm. implement systems, how to, how to hire people. So that's a good one to check out. Um, I, I want to circle back to, so we've talked about like the specific process. I appreciate you going into the details of that specific kind of step-by-step thing. That kind of gives people an idea of like how your day-to-day operations work, how this property manager is involved. You have handyman, you have your tenants involved. I think that's so, so smart there's this person though, this key role that you said, you said, I'm not good at building systems. I hire someone else who can help me build those systems and delegate. So I, I want to go there. You call them like your asset manager, but they've also helped you with other businesses. Could you talk about that role, that person and how you, how you came to hiring that person and then what that, what that relationship looks like and what, what that person has helped yeah. you do. There's two different um, people in a business there is a show horse and there's a workhorse, right? And um, I'm not a very good workhorse. And I don't, I'm, uh, I understand what the limitations of being a show horse are. And, and, and so the, the workhorse is kind of like the number two. Um, in some ways, they're not the face of it, but they're very much the engine of the business. So a lot of people might refer to that person as an integrator, but the business just can't really function without that person. Um, for me, that's my COO who I'm, I'm very fortunate to have. It's also the the same dynamic between me and my business partner, Joel. Um, Joel is, uh, in very much in very many ways, he's a, he's a visionary and we're, we're equal here, but he has this work ethic and this ability to just put his nose to the grindstone like that, that I don't have. And, um, so on, on the show horse side of things, you're, you're, you're more like casting the vision. You're thinking at 50,000 feet, you're in an owner seat, um, and, and, and leading the team in the direction that it's going. Um, and, and the workhorse or the integrator role, you're taking that vision and limiting and constraining it and saying, okay, well, we can't do all of your crazy ideas, Justin, it's too much, you know, <laughs> but but we're just going to agree to these two things or these three things that we're going to do over the next six months. And, um, and we're going to focus on those and cause they can see how these, all these intricate pieces go together. And so, um, for, for me, I, I sort of recognize my weakness of, of that. And, and I've tried to find people who have that, that quality about them and have that gift about them to be able to, you know, be the, be the role of integrator in the business. And that's really been the rocket fuel for the business, you know, more than anything else. So specifically, like I can't take any credit for that. Right. I mean, I, I hope, 
nobody feels like I am. <laughs> well, and, I, and I'll give you credit. I think it's interesting that that dichotomy between an integrator or a COO, the operations person, and then the, you could call it the CEO, visionary, owner of the business. Like that, those are both crucial roles. As a small business owner, sometimes I, I feel like we're even like a, we're torn between the two because most of us are better at one or the other, I think. And my, I, like, I'll speak for my business partner. My business partner uh, in real estate is definitely behind the scenes. Like he doesn't like being, like, I've tried to get him in front of the camera or talking to other people like, no, he, he just doesn't want to do it. But just on another level in terms of operations, asking mm-hmm. questions, systems, thinking through problems, problem solving. Like I, I kind of think about like an engineer almost. Like that person is, yeah. a, is an engineer and an implementer and a builder of, 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 of businesses and systems and problem solving. Whereas like the CEO role is often like the higher level marketing. Like you got to market your business. You're, you're the communicator. You're the person who has to you know, sell both the people internally on the vision and you got to sell people externally sometimes to raise money. Um, so that they're both critical. And like, so you, 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 you've, you've played a critical role in your business as well. But the, the trick I think, and I, what I would love your comment here on is on finding the integrator. And, and for those of us, like, let's go back to the small and mighty kind of model here. So in your specific case, like you're, instead of hiring a property manager, third party, party property manager, who could be, you could see that kind of as an integrator role, as an operator role, maybe within a property management business, you actually hired somebody internally to do that, which I think is really cool, really novel as well in the re- rental property business. So, so maybe can you talk about what that, from a rental property business standpoint, what that person needs, needs to do? And like, if somebody wants to do that themselves, if they're going to have 50 properties and hire that person, like what, what would they be looking for in that kind of person? And maybe just specifically, how do you go about that process of, of hiring that person? Um, yeah, I, first off, I think you have to lead. Um, so you have to be willing to be a leader who's going to attract that person. And one of the things that the, the, the very best thing that you can do is have a vision that's compelling that somebody wants to be a part of, you know, cause you're not going to attract really good talent unless you have a compelling vision that's meaningful. It's like, like our, our rental property business, it's just a rental property business and it's a passive thing. And And, but no, that's not what it's about. For me, I want to cultivate spaces of home and belonging for people so that they can raise families and get the same sense of love that I got in my home, you know? And so I feel like I'm changing the world and, and, and I want that vision and that mission to like permeate everything that we're doing. And so what, and I mean it like the way deep down into my core of this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So if you can communicate from a place of why, then you can find somebody who can do the how of that why or the what of that why. And so that that's kind of the 50,000 feet thing, but very practically making sure that you sort of have that game down and that you're not just, um, um, <laughs> you know, trying to, to orchestrate something that is, isn't going to... Um, really create any kind of depth or meaning for anybody or, 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 or there's not any truth to it. The thing that, the thing that you can be focused on is finding people who aren't just doers and really good at doing, I mentioned this before, but they're delegators. And so like, I don't really care if Olivia is working, you know, whatever, 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week. In fact, I really don't want her to work that hard. You know, when I give something to Olivia to do, I just trust that it's going to get done. And the way that it gets done is she's going to delegate, she's going to delegate or automate or systemize that entire thing. And I'm not sitting there keeping tabs on what her hours are or anything like that uh, be, because she's like 10 times more efficient than the doer by being the delegator and the systemizer. Right. And so I think just getting away from the idea that when you hire somebody, Um, you have to keep tabs on this person. You have to, you know, watch them very, very closely with the integrator rule. You have to give them a lot of latitude to be them. You know what I mean? To do their thing. And if they're a rock star, they'll flourish. Like you have to protect yourself and make sure that you're not um, exposing yourself unnecessarily. But, but that role knows the best thing to do better than you and how to accomplish the goals better than you do. They just don't know the vision. And so you have to be focused more on the vision and the leading while they're focused on implementing. 
Um, and, and so I think having, letting go of, of, um, I just want you to do these things and having some sort of like on high top down approach. That's not what it is. When you, when you hire somebody like a delegator or you're partnered with somebody who's a delegator or, or an, an integrator, you want to like lift them up, you know, as high as you possibly can. And the more you lift them up, the more they can accomplish. Right. Um, it's something like that. Does, does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. I like that. I like that answer. And, and I know some people will be thinking this from a practical standpoint too, a payment, like you're hiring a, a, a competent person, a qualified person who can self-manage themselves. This is also means you're going to be paying more. I would I mean, say paying more, but you're going to be, you, you got to pay up. You can't, you can't shortcut people who are, are talented. Right. And so no. for, for, for going back to our investment conversation, this is also a part of your growth is knowing when you can invest money and how you're getting a return from that money. So like if you hire an integrator, you, you have to have a business model that makes money from this investment of money you're paying them. Like you're paying, it, it, I assume, correct me if I'm wrong though, like this integrator role, are they typically somebody who wants a salary, wants just a set amount of money? Are they someone who also yeah. wants commission or equity? Like how does that kind of payment side of things work in your, your experience? Yeah, I think I think a lot of entrepreneurs make a mistake of thinking everybody thinks like them and wants the same things that they do, and that's just not simply not the case. Um, there's kind of these archetypes of people who, if Olivia were on here, she would say, "I I, I enjoy being an employee. You know, like I want to be an employee." And she's read. I've, you know, told her to read, you know, Rich Dad Poor Dad and Cashflow Quadrant, and she's read all these books, but. Um, she has this real gift, this God given gift, and she knows like how to make her mark on the world. And, and so uh, that, that I think not everybody is like you. <laughs> and so you can't just automatically assume that they want to take the same amount of risks or they want the same kinds of things. Some people, um, you know, they want the, some of the time freedom or the balance or they want the consistency that comes with uh, being paid. And some people like to work for commission. And I think there's different roles where you can say, okay, I ideally I would want somebody to want this in this position. And ideally I would want somebody to want this in this position. For instance, a salesperson, we pay a hundred percent commission. I don't want to pay any salesperson a salary. Um, you know, somebody who is an integrator, I want to pay more of a salary, but then have bonus structures to incentivize the growth of the business. And, and, you know, we're kind of talking, um, like about a, a a team that is, you know, not huge or anything, but definitely like a couple of layers to roles. You just start with hiring the very best person that's going to be potentially not just a technician. What I would encourage people to do is try to try to hire like a part time. If you can do full time, it's great. But even if you could just hire a part time manager as opposed to a full time technician, you may be able to level up really quickly, if that makes sense. Um, and, and you know, that's how kind of I was introduced uh, to this and I kind of fell into it, but it, it really solidified itself as I could see, okay, this person has a lot of ability, so I'm just going to support them and like give them, you know, the reins. And, um, and they just continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. And that's been like the most rewarding thing ever. Um, I mean, so somebody can start out really, okay, I'm just going to take 20 hours a week off of your plate. And once you realize what kind of freedom that gives you, if they're going to be an absolute rock star, then you're going to want to feed them more and give them more to do, right? To see where their limits are. Yeah. And something I've realized and been surprised about is the, the economy we're in. There are really competent, qualified people who might want to start off working part time and do 10 mm. to 20, 10 to 20 hours per week. Who, so we're talking about this integrator or these quality people in your business. There, there are people out there who could work virtually and be this kind of person who might start, who might eventually want to be full time. But have you found that as well? I mean, we're in the gig economy, right? People are used to kind of working, um, you know, p pieces yeah. of a job, so to speak. Is that, do you, do you, have you found that that's possible to find people doing that for the small investor, or the small entrepreneur, as opposed to having to pay somebody a full time salary right off, right off the bat? Yes, there's plenty of people who, you know, it's it, they're they're part time. They're working from home. 
Um, they don't want to go into the office and this is an opportunity because you're set up virtually. Um, my COO, she doesn't live here either, right? She's in another state. So both of my key team members on my property management company don't live in, uh, in town. And, um, but I, I think what people like the fractional manager or the fractional COO or the, um, fractional assistant, a lot of times those people are treated not as a team key team member. And that's where I would say that you have an opportunity treat that person like a key team member and be, if you can, if you can only do part-time, have the intention and a plan to where if this goes well, they're going to be full-time very quickly. And I can justify that. Um, because you, you really want somebody who's sold out for your vision, your mission and all that. I mean, I, I think that you can make the fractional thing work. Um, but I found that, um, you know, hiring people, keeping people, and this is definitely true for, um, assistance in the Philippines that you, you really want them to be working full time for you, uh, not dispersed amongst like two, three different businesses. So many questions I could ask here, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll I do want to ask one more question about virtual assistants that was on my mind. I think we could do a whole other episode, Justin, just on hiring virtual assistants and that process because I got a ton, ton more questions. But just one of the big benefits I've heard of hiring overseas is that you can get very qualified people. And there's just a an arbitrage of cost, you know, like all right, somebody working in another country, their cost of living's lower. Is that is that part of the strategy? I guess if you could hire a full time person working in the Philippines, for example, you could get a super qualified person who speaks English, who costs you less as a business owner to pay than you would hire somebody local. Is that is that accurate? Is that right. fair? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the the standard of living in the Philippines is twenty percent of what it is in the United States. And so um, you can be generous, right? And you can have room to grow as a small business by hiring somebody over there. So, um, you know, I, I found that people in the Philippines typically are making about 20 to 25% less than what people make in the United States. And we like to try and start people out like on the way high end of what people start out earning down there. So in some cases, double what a typical person might, might make. And so we track really, really good talent that way, but we also have room to grow. And so, um, my experience has been, I've tried to bring uh, a property manager in house and that's local, you know, we, and, and we thought we could, we, we got the best talent, you know, here that we could muster and the talent over there is a third of that cost. And, you know, again, three, four times better. So, I, there is an there is an arbitrage um, and an opportunity. I think, and and if you really want to capitalize on that opportunity, I just encourage people again, try to make that person a key team member. Um, they're not just somebody over there that's just there to, you know, do the dirty work and um, small tasks and be treated like you know somebody who's, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're people and and you have to treat them like like people. Um, so. There's a lot that we do, you know, to make sure that they feel like they're part of the team, that, you know, they, they adhere to our values and um, they're, they're thriving. Great. Love it. So what, one more technical question. We've got a, I'm going to put a lot of links we've talked about today. Asana, Buildium, Traction, the E-Myth. We're going to have links to all those. If, if someone is looking to hire um, overseas, do you, do you have any resources you, you could, maybe it's an educational resource, maybe it's a resource for kind of middle middle kind of company. Do you have anything for them to explore after the episode to, to look into that more? We've, we've used Upwork before, and that's a lot of just, um, you know, again, project or task oriented things. Um, but we found that onlinejobs.ph is a platform. It's kind of like the Indeed of um of the philippines and and so that's where we've hired all of our full-time virtual assistants onlinejobs.ph and um you know there's some videos on there and some resources about about that culture about you know how the hiring process how you can be successful in the hiring process and attract the best talent that's available uh so i you know that that stuff is worthwhile great okay awesome so we've covered a lot of ground, Justin, and I feel like we've we got even just scratched the surface, but we've talked about 
systems. We've talked about what those are, processes, and really, I just I, I appreciate that you've been willing to open up like the, you know, the the behind behind the scenes of what your rental property business looks like. Because I've I, I've talked to you about it, and I've just been fascinated how you've you've implemented some ideas that I think have been used at other industries. A lot of the online business world, online education is very common to have integrators and virtual assistants and people like that but like using in the real estate world is 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 is, is possible and it's even more relevant i think for small and mighty investors who want to do this in a way that's they still have some control over it but they're they're outsourcing it and having a team and and they can do it in a way that's economical as well so this has been fascinating i love it really appreciate you sharing do you, do you have any final comments, anything we didn't cover that you think will kind of wrap up this idea of, of automating your business, of, of building a, a rental property business that can run effectively, but also give you more space and life to do other things? Yeah, I, it's helpful to think about it. Just, you know, look, the right person in the right seat, right? And, and you might have to play musical chairs with what that looks like for yourself, for other people. You hire the wrong person. All of my mistakes have been in this front, all of my major mistakes have been in this front, but all of my major success has been in this front of finding the right people. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I attribute it to the people that have been on our team. So, you know, I think that finding the right person in the right seat and people who are congruent with your mission and your values and what you're doing is, is a really worthwhile exercise. And again, I think the business kind of just takes on a life of, of its own whenever you do that and you see culture and th these values sort of flourish and it's really fun to fun to see that so and, and worthwhile it, there's there's a payday um in doing that because you get to be you get to be the person in in the right seat at the end of the day in that business and and um that frees you up to be able to do you know like you say what matters and um it's a it's a, it's a very uh compelling thing to to be able to focus on and try to do yeah, I think what's really compelling to me of your story, Justin, and also it just reminds me, you know, I talk a lot about passive business and the assumption is you got this business and then you're going to go do what matters like somewhere else. Like, and that's true. Like, I, I like spending time with my kids. I like traveling. But the business itself matters. Like, it's, it's, mm. it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. And the, pe the people within it. The, the relationships you you have like I, I still my bookkeeper who was basically my integrator for a long time she she kind of grew into the property management role she retired and I and that's what kind of caused me to go the third party management route I just happened to have some team a couple t property manager teams I really liked and I was willing to hire them but I had sort of a more similar business model than you did with my integrator locally and she was she's a, a close family friend like she just the other day came and visited us I mean yeah. this is this is not just business, you know, this is, this is life. And for a small and mighty investor, what I think I just love that you've highlighted, Justin, is that from your tenants to the people who work for you, to your family, like this is all like integrated that like, we, we don't separate those things out. This isn't like a cold, like, you know, org, org chart in a corporation where it's just all business. Like this is life and business all mixed in, in the best mm -hmm. of ways. And I mm -hmm. appreciate, I appreciate you giving that, that kind of angle of real estate investing. Cause I don't think we talk about that enough. And I, I just, I'm inspired by what you're doing. So thank you for all that. Well, I've been very inspired by you and, and, you know, the, again, the template of the small and mighty investor, um, I've just got to say hats off to you on that book. Um, I'm so excited to, uh, know that it's getting a lot of traction and I got, I got like five copies the other day. <laughs> so I've been handing them out and, uh, really and truly, you know, I'm a big fan of yours, but I think it, it's up there in top three real estate books that I've ever read. Um, you know, it's like a classic status for me and, and because it has just all these it has all these things that you can just copy from and, and make your own. And, um, and so there's a lot of mechanics in there, but there's a great mindset and philosophy that underlies it. I just love that. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing the books. Uh, I want to I know people are going to want to stay in touch with you and you and I are going to be doing some work together behind the scenes as well. And, and with a community we have going on called rental property mastery, um, you're going to be, you're involved in there and I'm going to twist your arm a little bit to see if you can share some, even more of your wisdom that you have going on, but c tell people where they can hang out with you, how they can follow along with you if they want to stay in touch with you. Yeah, I'm pretty pumped about that. I'm trying to nix all of my social media and just focus on this little pro uh, rental property mastery community that that we're um, kicking off here. And uh, grateful to be a part of that. And there's some really cool people in there um, already. And so, 
Um, so, so that will be an option. I also do some hard money lending. If people are looking for loans, they can find us at homesoldfast.com uh, forward slash hard money. And if you got a deal that you're looking to, you know, get funded, uh, we could be an option there. Um, we've been lending sort of in our region, but are open to, you know, deals out, outside of our state. So um, maybe I can give you a link for that. Yep, absolutely. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. You'll see it in the YouTube and podcast description if you're listening and follow along with Justin. You can find him and I'll have more details about rental property mastery. It would depend on when you're listening to this. We, we've we kind of been doing a beta uh, behind the scenes private launch in, in August and September. But towards the end of September, early October, we're going to be, be rolling it out, opening it up to the public. And it's going to still be a small community uh, where we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be learning. We're going to be discussing with each other. We're going to be having accountability, helping you help implement your goals. A lot of good stuff. And this is where I'm going to be pouring my attention and coaching and uh, I just can't wait. This is going to be a lot of fun. So Justin, thank you so much for your time. Hope we can do this again. And uh, thank you again for being on. It's an honor, man. Thank you so much. All right. See you soon. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.